Hey everybody, Jen here with Sewing Report Live. One topic I've been talking about a lot here on this channel is influencer marketing. And I've actually gotten in touch with another YouTuber who has some really great thoughts and insight as well on influencer marketing and everything, navigating sponsorships, uh, ad deals, affiliate stuff, all of that. So we are going to be diving deep and I'm really excited about this guest. All right, so I want to welcome in to Sewing Report Live, Lindsay Wyrick with The Frugal Crafter. Welcome, Lindsay. Hi, thanks for having me, Jennifer. So this is kind of a chance thing, but I've done a few videos with some pretty strong, I'll, I'll just say hot takes on the influencer marketing space and all of that stuff. I've had some gripes, uh, especially with uh, like the brand stuff. And I first kind of got introduced to you because you left some pretty lengthy but very thoughtful comments on some of the videos. So I think the first one I remember you leaving a comment on was my Cricut video talking about the um, when Cricut took away like the free the free uploads and you had had some pretty you had had a very long history with Cricut. You left a really great comment and then I did another live stream recently and you left yet another really awesome uh, comment with some of the observations you had about what's been going on with the like creative uh, content stuff. Uh, so we thought we would get together and have a conversation. All right, so Lindsay, the first thing I wanna do is uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and you also have a very, very successful YouTube channel called The Frugal Crafter. Let's bring that up here. So Lindsay, ha you've been doing YouTube. I saw, I checked, you've been doing YouTube since 2010. You have about th almost 3,500 videos and you are around, you're kind of closing in on 600,000 subscribers. So congratulations on that. But the first thing I want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your uh, journey with content creation. Um, well, it's, um, it, it started because I was, um, well, if we go in the Wayback Machine, and we talked a little bit about this beforehand, I have a broadcasting background. And um, the broadcasting is it's fun and I loved being a DJ and, um, and it was all great and all, but then, but the, the pay wasn't really commensurate with the amount of work that you're putting in. And it's like, well, I might as well be an artist if I'm not going to, um, you know, if the pay is about the same. And so I had a studio downtown and I taught full time. And then when I got pregnant with twins, I realized I couldn't really run the studio and be there for the kids. So I decided to close that down, work from home and get back into media, but work in the magazine industry. And so I would send out stuff every month for like just uh, cold call submissions for different paintings, different craft projects to the different magazines at the time. And um, I said, I'd do it for a year. And if I had something picked up, great. And if I didn't, then it just wasn't meant to be. And on the 11th month, I had a necklace picked up for Bead Trends magazine. And uh, so then I would get published like maybe once every couple of months and the pay was either non-existent, free product or very, very little. So I'm like, well, this isn't how people make a living with their art. And um, at that time, blogging was kind of up and coming. And this was oh, probably around 2008. And I thought, well, you know, I could I could keep pitching and keep pitching and keep hearing nothing, not even a no thank you, but like nothing. Um, or I could just put my own content on my own platform and see what happens. And I started my blog around 2008. And then um, about a year or two later, I was thinking, I wish I could just teach. I wish I could just say what I want to say instead of having to type it out and do tutorials like I used to in my classes. And I was looking for a place where I could put my videos up and the blog the video package for my blog was rather expensive. And then I heard about YouTube. And so I just started a channel and I started putting my videos, like just making very simple DIY crafting tutorials. Because at the time when I started my blog, I was thinking I would love to write a book that was like recipes for artists and crafters. Because I used to do a class where I would take local educators and show them ways they can integrate art projects with their regular class curriculum and how to make a lot of supplies so they wouldn't have to like stretch, like break their budget to be able to do like Native American studies and these different projects they could do or like other cross-cultural cultural projects that they could integrate into their classrooms. And um, I thought, what if I made a recipe book that was like how to make faux leather for projects, how to make, ink, how to refill ink pads, how to make um, spray inks, how to make, you know, all these different things that artists and crafters would like. And, um, and so I started putting that content on my blog and I called it the frugal crafter because I figured if I ever wrote a book, that's what I would call it. And then I just started creating video content because it was easier than all the typing. And 
Um, then I started realizing that people were leaving comments on YouTube. I didn't really go to YouTube. I just kind of would upload it and I would get the URL and put it in my blog. And then I realized there was this whole community of people on YouTube that were looking for art and craft content and looking for tutorials and, and whatnot. So then I spent up putting more energy into YouTube, still doing my blog and putting everything on my blog. But um, the community really found its feet, I think, over on YouTube. And that's kind of how it all began. And I never really saw of it, saw it as a way to make a living directly. I mean, if I got the book picked up and published, then that would be uh, my <laughs> my path to riches, I thought. You know, I clearly did not know about the book publishing world, and just like the magazine publishing world. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I got into it. I just wanted to share with people while I was kind of home with kids. And now the kids are in college, so... <laughs> You know, and it's it's interesting to see the evolution of YouTube. Like, you're one of the OG creators, because I think YouTube, I remember it kind of becoming a thing, like 2005, 2006. Uh, but when YouTube started, people really weren't making money with YouTube. It seemed like, to me at least, it seemed like it was more like America's Funniest Home Videos, but on the internet. Like, people were uploading, like, cat videos. You know, like, it wasn't, like, seen as a broadcast medium. It was more seen as, like almost more like what Facebook was in the early days where people would just post life updates and stuff. But since then, now everyone sees YouTube as like a money-making venture. And a lot of kids want to be YouTubers. They want to aspire to be a YouTuber instead of being like a movie star or like a rock, you know, like a football player or something like that. Um, so can you briefly kind of go over, a lot of people ask me this, how does the money work with YouTube? How, you know, again, you don't have to say numbers, but Kind of where does the income come from as like a YouTube creator? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. So when I think it was about 2012, I got invited into the YouTube partner program. Now you can join if you have over a thousand subscribers and 400. 4,000 minutes of watch time, I think, within a year. Um, but back in the day, you had to be invited in. And so I accepted the invitation and I turned on ads and it was like making like 12 cents a video. I'm like, I'm not making people sit through ads for 12 cents. So I turned it off and didn't think anything about it. And then about a couple of years later, um, somebody that, um, uh, one of my husband's coworkers said, Hey, your, your wife's YouTube channel is doing really well. Does she monetize it? And he's like, no, he's like, he, she should turn on the ads. And so I turned on the ads in that first month, I made a hundred dollars and that was a lot of money at the time. I'm like, oh my goodness. And then it wasn't, it was right around that time I had used um, a rubber stamp company's button stamps to make these like faux buttons on button cards. I stamped them out of a bunch of um, sheets of paper and cut them out and stacked them up so they were thick like buttons. And I guess they sold a lot of a lot of stamps with that because the woman just unsolicited sent me a check saying, thank you so much for using our products in your video. If we want to share the proceeds with you. And I was like, wow, there's, there's some money to be made there. And then a company reached out to me called Paper Mart, which is a big kind of like a paper goods company out of California. And they sell like um, boxes and, and bags and party supplies and ribbon, a lot of ribbon. And so they hired me to do a video, a tutorial every week where I would, I would make a project and I would use their products. And um, so then I started to see that, wow, there's actually, you can actually make a living this way. And I don't do many sponsored videos these days, but in the early days, sponsored videos was probably the best way to make money because the ads weren't paying all that much. And, um, and advertisers could reach the exact clients, the customer base they wanted, because if they advertise their products on a crafting tutorial and they sell craft products and it's a very good, um, it's a very good mix and the viewers are getting what they want, free tutorials and the brands getting what they want, um, exposure to people that want to buy craft materials and the YouTubers getting what they want, um, some money for the time they spend putting into the videos. And, uh, and that, you know, that was really good. Uh, I think it's still pretty good. I just don't like to do sponsored videos that much anymore. And then of course, uh, affiliate links. If you watch a YouTuber's video and you look in the video description, what you should see <laughs> is a little disclosure saying like affiliate links used or, um, something like that to that effect. Sometimes you have to scroll to the bottom, but it really should be right where the supplies are listed. So if, when I do a uh, tutorial, I will use affiliate links and I will put like supply list and in parentheses, I'll put affiliate links used and then I'll list out, you know, 
whatever watercolor paper I used, whatever rubber stamp set I used, whatever paints I used. And that way people can find it easily, the exact product that I used. And um, in return, if they purchase it, then I will get a small commission and it doesn't cost them anything extra than if they just Googled it, found it themselves. So, I mean, that's nice because it does help the viewer watching the video find the exact product he used. It helps the uh, creator pay for their time because they get a kickback on the uh, on the products. And then it obviously it helps the brand, whoever's selling the stuff, because they don't have to pay unless something sells. So that's, um, that's one way to do it. But I think probably the best way that creators online make money is if they sell a product themselves, either they're creating a physical product or they're selling a course or they're selling templates or they're selling something that, um, that they're going to keep the majority of the money from. No, that's a really good point too. And, you know, I actually am a big fan of affiliate programs just because I kind of find that I like that the brand isn't really involved in the content. And that's kind of why I like the Amazon program. I'm in a couple other affiliate programs, but I think one, you know, I, I've seen some folks say, you know, they don't really like affiliate marketing or whatnot. And I get that, but I think they also have to realize that in general, generally, the brands don't insert themselves into the creation process this way. And I do think that's a, a positive overall because, you know, it's not like Amazon. They have some rules you have to follow, but it's not like Amazon's coming to you and saying you have to say this, this and this about the products. You can gener- you can speak pretty freely about anything with the affiliate products. And then so people still get like the like your authentic opinion about it. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Usually brands have no idea that you're sharing a link unless it brings in a lot of traffic and they can somehow track it back to you because a lot of times with our supplies on Amazon, they're sold by third party sellers. Like it may be actually Blick Art Materials or Jerry's Arama selling it on Amazon. It's not Amazon.com selling it. So they wouldn't necessarily have access to that data to know that it was your tutorial that sent a bunch of people there or whatnot. So you can speak completely freely when you're reviewing a product, whether you like it or you don't like it. And um, yeah, I like that too, because you also don't have to wait for approval where if you're doing a sponsored video and you're being paid by a brand to showcase something, then they're going to want to see it and approve it before you um, you post it. And I've even had some companies that have reached out to me to ask if I would review a product, want to see the video before it goes live. And I'm like, uh, if you're sending me this to review it, you don't need to know what I'm saying about it before it goes live. You're getting it in front of eyeballs. That's the deal. Uh, so yeah, it's just, there's way more expectation when you're doing a sponsored video yeah. and it's no, way I- more pay generally, but you know, it's just, uh, it's a lot more, it's a lot more constraining for your time because you usually have to work with like their timelines because if they're releasing a product that's not available to the public yet, they want to make sure it's going to go, <clears throat> it's going to go live when, when the product is available for purchase. And yeah, it's just, it's a lot of, it's just more of a hassle, I, I would say. So one thing I really like about your content, Lindsay, is the authenticity. I feel like, I feel like you're very trustworthy and you're actually saying what you really think. Um, what are your kind of, do you have some sort of your own ethics, ethical system or kind of guide, standards for yourself as a content creator when you're doing, you know, even the affiliate stuff or brand deals or sponsorships? What, what are your sort of, you know, what are some standards you've put in place for yourself? Um, well, the, I have standard. Uh, well, I have my first standard is just always be honest because, um, if you say something's great and it's not, then you've just blown all your trustworthiness. And in this time, I mean, you have to understand that, and I will sometimes get a lot of hate. I recently reviewed a product that was loved by many and, uh, it just didn't meet the claims. It was just, I'm just going to leave it at that. Cause I don't want to bring the haters in from that video. Cause I really ruffled some feathers. Um, but I, YouTubers have nothing to gain financially by posting a negative review. And so it can be kind of, it can be very frustrating when you spend a lot of time, like, like I'll do a couple paintings with a project, with a product and really put it through its paces on different days when I'm in different moods, just to make sure I'm not thinking badly of this product or overly goodly of this product because I'm in a good mood or a bad mood. And um, I want to get the most honest take on it and try to figure out who this could be good for, who this is not good for, and get all that information out there so people can decide for themselves and also tell people to check out other people's reviews and not just go from one review. So always be honest is my first is my first 
guideline. The second guideline would be uh, always disclose if I was given a product for free, if I bought it, how much I paid for it, or um, and I don't do sponsored reviews. So if I'm doing a sponsored video, it's not a review. I'll I'll, I'll showcase a product. I'll show you how to use it, but there will not be it will not be a review. If I was to review that product in the future, it would be when I'm kind of disentangled from that project or that uh, that relationship anyway. So um, so that's it. You know, disclose if I'm using an affiliate link so they know if I have anything financially to gain from them buying it. Because I think that it's important to know, even if you are com- the most unbiased person in the world, we're human, right? I think it is their right to know whether you are going to benefit financially from them buying that. It is their right to know whether you're given it for free or you shelled out your own hard earned money for it. Just because just in case it weights your judgment whatsoever, the viewer should have their, their own right to take that information and decide whether they think it's going to weight your judgment or not. Or, you know, it's just, they need to have all the information before they watch that review to decide whether it's for them. And I know some people will not watch a review if they know the product was given to the influencer. And I want them to know that right off the bat. You know, I don't want them to get 45 minutes into, because my review videos can get in depth. I don't want them to get to the end. And I say, oh, by the way, I was given this for free. And they're like, I wouldn't have watched it if I knew that. You know what I mean? And most people don't watch to the end. So that's not really fair either. So you know, disclosing it verbally at the start of the video and in the video description. So there's no, uh, there's no misleading, yeah. not intentionally or unintentionally misleading anybody, but you know, that's pretty much it. And actually use the product. Don't just like, I, I uh, one of my pet peeves is the, the reviews that is just somebody picking it up for the first time, yeah. opening the box and swatching it out. That's not a review. That's like whatever, whatever mood you're in that day, swatching out that paint that's not a review. You could be having the crappiest day and say the pain is junk. You could be having the best day and say the, the pain is wonderful. It's not, you haven't used it enough for that to be a review in my opinion, my opinion. No, I think, and you know what? I've seen a lot of viewers who are, who do get kind of annoyed with people who will do like a 45 minute video and don't say it was given to them until the end. Like I've definitely seen a few or, you know, and there's kind of a big, snafu going on right now in the tech niche because there's a company called like insta 360 and they're doing a lot of people are putting out what looks like sponsored content but they're not disclosing so there's some allegations that you know there's some allegations that maybe the company has been encouraging people not to disclose um and just if, if for the folks that are not aware if you're in the united states Uh, We have something called the Federal Trade Commission and influencers are required to disclose any relationship that's like financial, business, personal, or even like, you know, if you have like friends that own a business and you plug their thing. Uh, So I'll link this in the description box, but this is the uh, basically a guide for influencers. And I've seen, I don't know about you, Lindsay, but I've seen a lot of content, particularly on Instagram and TikTok that I feel is not doing, that I feel are not doing all of the disclosures. Have you noticed, have you noticed a lot more of that type of thing online? I think I've been seeing it all along, but I don't know if it's just ignorance on the part of the, um, uh, the content creator, because a lot of them are smaller channels and they might not understand what they're supposed to do. I don't like to think people are, are, uh, deceiving people on purpose but one thing that I notice a lot and it's and I I wouldn't even know this unless I was getting the emails too but I get emails every day from there's so many like kind of fly-by-night paint companies that pop up on Amazon and they're just trying to get anybody to to show their products online and um and my rule is if I haven't had six people independently ask me to review this product then I'm not going to accept it unless if it's something that I find completely interesting because some, I have some relationships with some brands and when they're coming out with a new product, they'll send it to me before it's available to purchase. So if I can work with it for a while and do a review and have that ready before it's a, like at the time it's going out, then that's very helpful. I think because it can help people decide whether it's for them or not, rather than just like, Oh, new thing, better buy it. You know, they can be like, hold on, let me see. Is this for me? Cause I do pros and cons. There's no product I've ever used that is all pros or all cons for that matter. Um, so unless it's one of those like super interesting things that the only way you're going to get it is if you have a relationship and you can see it early. Um, I need to have like six different people independently ask me for this. 
Um, and then in that case, I'm usually going and buying it myself, but sometimes serendipity happens and it's something I haven't heard about yet. And then six people have asked me because they've seen it advertised on Instagram or something. And then just so happens the brand reaches out to me the next day and they're like, oh, actually, sure. Yeah, I'll take that because somebody was asking me for it. But um, but yeah, the, you get these offers every day. And most of these things are just the same exact product with a different label on it because there's so much white labeling going on in the craft industry right now. Um, but then I will see hauls and it will be all those products that I just got in my inbox over the last couple of weeks. And they're just doing a haul. And that I think is doubly problematic because all they're doing is just, hey, look at all this stuff I have. And they're not saying that it was sent to me for free. They're just saying, I got this and then I got this and I got this. And it makes it feel, it makes it seem like it's normal to be having that much of an influx all the time. And if people don't know it's being given for free, they're thinking this person who's just like them, they watch on, that just a regular person is out buying this. And well, it's only $20 here, only $20 there, only $5 here, only $5 there. And then it kind of enables and justifies that massive excessive consumption that um, I know I have to fight all the time because I see something new and I want to try it because it looks interesting and you know that'd be fun to show on my channel you know I have the extra excuse so I'm fighting that same devil but I know that that's just making it seem so much more normalized and um and then making it making it seem like this is what everybody does because we're because we're regular people because we're on YouTube and if if she's doing it then I I should do it too you know and it's 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 like you know, I feel like saying yeah no on that example don't do that <laughs> well yeah. so I want to talk about this a little bit more because I do think that it I almost think for the brands I'll they'll do those like influencer campaigns and they'll hit up like you know fifty influencers I feel like that makes the whole campaign seemed very manufactured. Like if I was them, I wouldn't do that. Like I would kind of do more organic relationships with individual influencers. But I think it seems kind of suspect when all of a sudden you see everyone in your niche reviewing or like unboxing or showcasing the same product. You're like, okay, well this was sent to all of these people. Like this happens in beauty. This happens in tech where when everyone is featuring the same product, it makes all of that content seem kind of like suspicious you're you're automatically kind of on guard when you see all of that because mm. you're like well this isn't you know yeah you're like this is a little weird I don't know so I've gotten a lot so one example so I there's a fabric company that I've actually purchased from before and I was like okay cool they make decent products and I've plugged them before just on my own uh so but I have a policy that well one I don't do any of the Amazon Amazon sellers like if it's like a company I've never heard of and they only sell on Amazon. I don't accept freebies from them and I would never do like a, I don't really do sponsorships either at this point because most companies just, it's almost like they can't think outside their like corporate box. It's like, you know, we want to do X, Y, Z, but if you propose like, you know, something else, it's almost like they can't compute. So I had this company re it message me on Instagram and they're like, Hey, we really like your content. Uh, you know, we, you know, would you be interested in maybe doing something with this? And I was like, well, you know, email me or whatnot and I'll, uh, you know, we can, we can chat because I do actually, I do actually like their products. So they reached out to me and they pitched the same, you know, the same thing that, ever, you know, it's like, and they always, all of these proposals look the same. It's like, we'll send you this product, you know, you pick a product from our website you know, we want you to post the, you know, like Instagram reel and a YouTube video. We have to approve the content. And, you know, all the contracts seem kind of standard. So I wrote back and I was, you know, and of course they wanted brand approval. And I'm sure they wanted like a non-disparagement agreement and a non-compete or something, you know, some sort of exclusivity. So I wrote back and I was like, hey, this just wouldn't work for me. I don't do that type of content. And I also don't, at this point, I don't do integrated videos. Um, I'm more looking for like, podcast style ad reads where the content is separate from like the ad I almost kind of those don't bother me as much because I feel like the viewer I know in my again I know everyone's cut can do their own thing but I kind of feel like I like that separation where the viewer is like okay this is the ad and then this is the content and they don't mix um so that's just personally what I prefer so I, I wrote back to this company. I said, hey, you know, I don't do integrated videos like this where I would like unbox your product or whatever and it's paid. And they're like, oh, well, never mind then. Like they wouldn't even consider any. That's the thing. They wouldn't even consider any other arrangement. And I even said, hey, would you consider uh, an ad read in, another, in a video? And I kind of explained how it worked and I sent them an example and they're like, no, thanks. And I was like, well, OK, then, you know. 
I, it's like, what do you, some of these brands, I just find they're not, they're just not on board with anything that's outside that like, you know, cookie cutter thing. I don't know. Have you kind of found that too? Well, I, most everything I would do would be integrated because I, and that's something I've, I've thought about because I was talking to another creator who is in the woodworking vertical and he said that, um, that actually the, the companies that do power tools and stuff, they won't pay for the, for sponsored videos. They'll give you free stuff, but they won't like sponsor a video. So he would do these, um, kind of, it would kind of be off the wall, uh, uh, companies he always made it funny he did a really good job with it but they'd be like you know casper beds it seemed like for a while everybody was doing casper ads but um but he would like kind of do an ad break and it would make it funny and he'd put it in there but it wouldn't have anything to do with his regular content and i thought about that because sometimes you get hit up by different brands that want to advertise your product and they want like a something at the beginning or the end of the, your video but the thing is it's like i know art supplies and i know craft supplies and i don't know these other products so I wouldn't feel comfortable talking about them, even if it was an ad read, just because I don't know, like, I don't use a VPN. I don't know what that is. I don't mm -hmm. know, you know, just so many different products that they want to advertise. And if you haven't used their service, then you either have to spend a lot of time learning how to use their service. And I'm not a very techie person and I don't really enjoy that. I learned what I need to learn. And then I, you know, that's it. Um, so I haven't done the non-craft, like non-art, non-integrated stuff just because, I feel like if people are coming here, they're coming here to see the the craft and, and art content. And I want it to work with that. And I, I don't know, I guess I kind of also like to prop up brands that are bringing innovative craft and art products. But, oh, and I just want to yeah, be clear. I'm know. not like I if I did the ad reads, I would want them to be like niche related. Like I got an I mm -hmm. legit got a sponsorship offer from the Morgan and Morgan personal injury law firm. I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> and it was. The, their proposal was wild. I was like, and the funny thing is I saw other YouTubers actually do it. And I was like, wow, like the, the law firm. Yeah. Um, like wow. the thing I was thinking was I would love to get like, at least in my niche, I would love to get established sewing brands that would just, you know, sponsor the video, but again, do an ad read. Um, and I think my problem runs into the fact that I do a lot of critical content about the industry and I think that makes it tough. Like, I think if I was like, um, like I have these friends where they do like cosplay sewing and create crafting. And I think sponsorships work a lot better for them because they're, you know, they might use a certain brand of sewing machine that's sponsored, but they're not like doing a review on the sewing machine. They're like making mm -hmm. a dress and they just happen to be using this thing. So I do yeah. think it really depends on what type of content you make. Like if you're just doing a painting and you happen to use like, some, you know, X brand paint and it's sponsored. Like, I don't, I, I and I just want to be clear, I don't think that's problematic at all. I think that's, you know, totally fine. I think for me, the problem comes into, like when we saw with the cricket thing, a lot of people couldn't really talk about what was going on with cricket because they were sponsored by cricket. And I think that's the, I, so I do think kind of the niche I've chose, and again, on my, this channel, Sewing Report Live, we do a lot of industry news, uh, talking about what's going on, like I'll, you know, point out different things happening with different companies. And I do think that makes it a bit tough for that particular angle. Um, but yeah, it, it is funny, though, how a lot of these brands, like if you propose anything that's like kind of out of their general standard wheelhouse, it's like they just can't even like picture it. Like they don't even want to consider it or like something different, you know, anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I, I don't know. Have you run into that at all or is it just me? I don't know run into that too much um but I haven't hmm. yeah I actually haven't really run into that too much usually they're kind of looking for ideas so that's what I found but maybe like when they're talking about five thousand dollar embroidery machines the stakes are a little bit higher yeah, than you know, know some ten dollar tubes of paint so oh and the brother people the brother people hate me now so I'm like okay Oh, they no. definitely are not, a fit, but that's fine. You know, like, that's the thing. Like I never had a sponsorship with them anyway. So it's not like, you know, I don't know, but it is kind of funny, yeah. but, and, you know, and it's funny because I did that one video talking about like sponsorships and influencer stuff. And, um, you know, I kind of pointed out with a lot of the contracts you see, they'll have a non-disparagement clause in there. Like you can't say anything 
negative about the brand or whatever. And someone was really, another YouTuber wrote back and they were like very upset about that. They're like, well, I've never had that. I was like, every single contract I've seen that's been sent to me has something like that in there. Like, you know, you won't, you won't <laughs> say anything negative about the brand. Like that's been in every contract I've seen. So I'm not, I don't know. I, and I also think some influencers get mad at me too because I'll talk about these things. So I don't know. It's been, I don't know. It's been, it's been tough to make friends. I'll just say that. I don't know. The thing I see in contracts a lot, that, and I think probably a lot of people don't really read the contracts, but the thing that I see in contracts a lot is the, um, we will own this content in Ooh. perpetuity. It's like, oh no. <laughs> then, and they always take it out. It's like, they're just seeing what they can pull, I think at yeah. that point. Um, but yeah, they, I've, let's see, I'm trying to think. I think I had a, a contract once with a company that did glue guns and uh, it was, the, the weird thing was like a six months exclusivity you can't show another brand glue yeah. gun on camera oh, yeah. no, i've seen those too. Of time yep i'm trying to think i hmm let's see if i think i think i've had a morality clause in one before oh, nice. it's like you'll not do nothing to you know i guess no promoting your only fans or any, you know it's like what are they i don't know well it's it is funny because sometimes the contracts i'm like this is so like that's the thing like i can't sign anything that's like restrictive like that because, like, that's the thing. I, I criticize a lot of these brands. So, like, you know, like, they the brother company definitely did not like my videos on the Skitch. I'll just, because they actually sent me, like, a nasty email. So I was like, okay. Well, <laughs> but you it's bought like, it. I mean. Yeah, it's the thing. I bought it. And I felt like they were, their marketing for the product was pretty misleading about the app. Like, basically, you can't use this embroidery machine without the app. Like, so it's, they're basically like, yeah, doing I hate cricket. that. It's like a yeah. cricket. Yeah. Yeah. They're basically yeah. doing the cricket, you know? And, and that's the thing when the whole cricket thing happened again, these cricket influencers didn't say zip, you know, and I got it, you know, they're getting paid by cricket. Those affiliates make huge amounts of money, small channels. Yeah. I know a small cricket influence, small channel in the scope of channels, um, making quarter of a million dollars a year. Oh and it was a cricket affiliate money wow. so that's why yeah i mean they would be they would be foolish to bite the hand that feeds but, them and yeah. Sakani, that kind of money um for promoting cricket products it's yeah of course they're quiet about it and when you have one company that dominates the craft stores and even department stores like cricket does it's um it's kind of low-hanging fruit so People can, it's so easy for people to just go and buy a cheap machine because I remember when they used to be made well. Mike, I have two Cricut machines back from the first, like, off the off the factory Dude, floor. Me too! I had a 2009 yeah, Cricut Expression. <laughs> yeah, it, it was heavy. Everything was metal. Yeah. Everything is, you know, it's still cutting, but I use, an, I use a shortcut slot software, so I don't use any Cricut products with it anymore. But, um, and I still use it as my digital plotter. Anytime I'm designing something, I use my scale software and I cut it. That machine was good. The old machines were great, but then they cut corners. They made these plastic uh, innards, like the, the blade housing was plastic in their newer models. You pick mm -hmm. them up, they're light, like sewing machines, like the, the junky yeah. sewing machines that cost a hundred dollars at the department store that will get you through enough curtains to put in your house. And after that, it's not going to sew and it's going to, thread's going to bunch up and stuff. Same thing with those machines. And, um, but they were cheap enough that everybody could get their hands on them. And then I know that's privileged to say $100, $200 for a machine isn't cheap for a lot of people, um, especially for a hobby. But just comparatively to the you yeah. know, $700 you would pay for a, you know, a professional or low-end professional plotter. Um, so then they got the machines, so they got to buy the stuff to go with it. And, I mean, there was just so much money to be made. Yeah. And um, when they started suing all the companies that were making software, they could cut with their machines, which was open. Their machines were based on open source so source software. So anybody could use that open source code to create products to go with it. And then they started bullying all these um, these smaller software developers. And that just that was that was the end of me using Cricut products because they um, they shut them down. They weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't stealing their IP. They weren't stealing their designs. Sure cuts a lot wasn't anyways. I don't know about Make the Cut or any of the other uh, brands, but um, they were just, you know, so you could cut your fonts, just like you could print anything with your printer. You could cut anything with your cutter. And um, that just really left a bad taste in my mouth. And I I don't think I've mentioned the the word cricket. I just refer to my, I my know, dad right? cutter, well, no, you know. By the way, this is, we are not sponsored by cricket. We're clearly... Well, and I, th I think that kind of highlights, too, because I, 
the, when I started talking about the cricket thing, that's the first time I was introduced to you because you left that comment. You were sharing all the tea on the backstory uh, with cricket. And I think this also highlights the need for independent media to cover different spaces. Um, again, when you get people who are sponsored by all of these companies, again, they again they make their own quality content about certain things, uh, but you kind of need media for you know certain areas. You know, there is a need for some independent uh, journalism or reporting on some of these companies. And again, you and I both worked in news, and traditional legacy news doesn't really cover the crafting and art space a lot. Not with these types of issues. Like, I think the cricket thing got picked up a little bit wider. Like, it got picked up by, like, The Verge and some other outlets. But not you're not going to see an expose on cricket done by ABC News or anything. Mm -hmm. So they're not really looking at those areas. And I, I almost think that's how a lot of the companies in the, the crafting creative space aren't... They're not really used to people criticizing them. Because people generally don't mm -hmm. online. Um mm -hmm. And I, I do, I think that's something I kind of found out when I started doing that type of content is they were not fans. Uh, you know, I'm not going to mm -hmm. get invited to any of these influencer, you know, events or anything. I don't think there are no, any big influencer yeah, parties any, in the craft there, industry. <laughs> there are some with like the soy machine manufacturers, oh, uh, yeah. like, and they've got like a batter. So like, I think Baby Lock does it and some other brother and they'll invite them on like retreats and stuff. But the oh. thing with that is that if you're an ambassador for one of those companies, you can only use that brand's machines. And that's the thing. Like, that's not realistic for me. I use all different brands. So, like, I can't – like, I wouldn't be able to do the exclusivity thing. And the other thing I wouldn't be able to do is say anything that's not, you know, glowingly positive. Um, oh. So that's kind of what – that's – I don't know. That's one gri gripe I have with, like, the sewing industry brands is – I feel like they want, they are going to such great lengths to control the content that exists about all of the companies, you know, by doing the sponsorships and brand deals and having the non-disparagement clauses, um, that it kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth where a lot of these brands don't like, uh, they don't like uh, the, you know, more brutally honest content. You know, they're definitely not into that. Um, and, but at the same time, from a viewer standpoint, they want authentic content and they don't want people, you know, just being all hearts and rainbows about everything. And, you know, that's something you pointed out in your latest comment uh, to me is you're you are seeing a lot of content where there's just nothing negative. You know, no one's mm -hmm. no one's criticizing anything. Do you feel like that's kind of a problem? Well, I, I think I, I can see why why um, influencers would rather not criticize things like I know. Um, I know several creators in the rubber stamp industry kind of that's a pretty big um, like paper crafting is a pretty popular type of crafting. And um, there are several influencers that I know that will not do a negative review. So if it's a product and they try it and they don't like it, they just won't show it yeah. on their channel. Yeah, I've, I've kind of had the same. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. And I can also understand it because, you know, if you um, have something, and I never have anything that like, this is trash, this is garbage. I'm never like slamming or doing a salty review. I'm just trying to put out the information. And if I find that, that things are not as promised or the value's not there, I'm going to say it. And I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out things. If somebody calls a product professional and it's not using the ingredients to, that weren't a professional label, if they're, you know, hyping it up and it just isn't warranted, if it's overpriced for what it is, if it's the exact same thing as something else that is sold that's a white label product under a different brand. That's like a quarter of the price. I'm just going to mention it. Um, you know, uh, cause I think people deserve, deserve to know that if you know that information, then you should share that information. But, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of people that will only do positive reviews and I can also see it for, for one, they don't want to deal with the a flack from their audience or the brands. But the other thing is they, well, the, the second reason is they may not want to put themselves in a position where brands will stop sending them stuff or stop yep. sponsoring their videos and the other thing is, if you're posting a negative review, the only money you're going to make from that video is, is whatever you're making on ads. Yeah. Because you're, you know, even if you have an affiliate link, nobody's going to buy it because you've just told them that it's not worth buying. Um, so why would they spend, like, I spend... I spend days on a review for like a small paint set that might cost $50 or maybe even $20. And if it's junk, it's, you know, I, I think it's important to have that information out there. So I don't consider it time wasted, but it's definitely time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get my money back on that time. 
um, that I've put into that review. I'm glad that it's out there and hopefully um, people will check it out if they're interested in buying that product so they can see all sides of it. But um, yeah, YouTubers have nothing to gain financially for posting a negative review, but I, I do think it's important. Yeah, no, and you brought up a really good point that, yeah, there's no financial incentive to make a negative review or a critical review of anything because when I noticed this with the sketch, it got a lot of views and I ended up making the money back on it from the AdSense. Uh, but yeah, and we I was, I put affiliate links in there. I was like, have you, you know, buy at your own risk. A few people actually did buy it and I was kind of surprised. I also got comments saying, I bought this, it's junk, I'm returning it. So, but that's the thing. I, you know, to me, it was worth it because I, I just wanted to, I wanted there to be like a legitimate review on this product because it was very, you know, different than other embroider machines. Um, you know, and I just, you know, and that's the thing I think people, and I think that's one reason why your content resonates with a lot of people is because they, they feel like you're going to give it to them straight, you know? And I, I think there's a real demand for that type of content now. Um, you, you know, you may have seen in that live stream that, uh, there is a tech reviewer named Marquez Brownlee and he got some heat for doing a review on this AI wearable pin uh, called Humane and he titled it this is like the worst this might be the worst product I've reviewed yet or something and he got some hate for his you know for doing the review he was basically like this he also did another uh he did another review like in the past week on a similar product. And he's like, look, these companies are putting out garbage products like before they're ready for the market. So he's been getting some criticism like he's, you know, you know, punching down in the, you know, he's destroying these companies or whatever. But I'm like, look, it's his channel. I think he can do what he wants. And, you know, and he kind of pointed out in his video about doing reviews, he does the reviews for the viewers. He's not making these reviews for the companies. Um, but again, I think that's why he's got like so many subscribers and he's such a big name in the space is because um, he's being very authentic with his experiences. Also a lot like from the viewers that will attack uh, a creator for doing a negative review. I think there's also, especially in the craft industry and in the craft community where it's so um, it's mostly female, it's mostly women um, and where a lot of women that have started crafting, have thought about, it would be great to be, to work in this space, to be on the design team, to work for one of these companies. And I think they can see somebody that's been given product as being uh, really ungrateful if they don't return that favor by saying something nice about the product. So I think, because we, it's such a strange dynamic. I don't know if it's the same in the sewing community, but in the paper crafting community, yeah. there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of unpaid labor being done by women. There's a lot of design teams where these uh, the hundreds of, of mostly women, men, some men, but it's mostly women, will apply to basically work for free or work for product for a term of six or 12 months, take on that stress, be working basically part time for these companies unpaid. And they will like they, they all there's so many people that want to do it. And um, and I think that there's a certain amount of. Uh, feeling well they're being nice to me they're allowing me on their team and they're giving me these products and and so it's it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome type yeah, relationship no, yeah you know I mean these these women are lovely and I don't want and I think most of these companies are they're they're good companies but obviously they're going to get what they can get from people that are willing to give it you know yeah it's like why pay more for something if you don't have to like and there's and there's so and there's just so many people that want to do it and are willing to do it. And if they want to do it, they want to do it. That's fine. That's their choice. Um, but I think that a lot of times people will project themselves their their views on the content they're watching. And if they're seeing somebody review a watercolor set and they're not ha they're not they're saying this isn't the best that's out there. If they already bought that watercolor set, they're going to think, well, I just wasted my money. They don't want to take that. They don't want to feel like they wasted their money. They would rather feel like this person is ungrateful and they should be more appreciative that they got that sent to them and they should give it a good review rather than thinking, I just wasted my money on this thing or uh, that's a company that I want to work for someday. How dare they say this about that? I'm going to defend that company, you know, because I have this weird relationship with this, you know, this company. I don't know if I expressed that very well, but, 
but that's something else I see too. Just this kind of, this kind of, you're, you should be nice. You were given this thing. You should be nice. So there's kind of, there's kind of a thing. Do you know what like indie sewing pattern companies are? They're like, not like the simplicity or the McCall's, but they're like, kind of like a lot of these people start out as influencers and then they start their Mm -hmm. own sewing pattern companies. There's quite a few of them. Um, but there's kind of a thing where people are afraid to say anything critical about these indie pattern designs. You know, they're like, you know, like if I, if I did some videos and I was, you know, if I said anything kind of remotely negative about like an indie pattern, I would probably get some negative, you know, response or backlash uh, because it would be seen as like bullying the pattern designer or like punching down or especially if they had like a smaller social media following. But at the same time, you know, and I've, I've asked my audience, I was like, would you, do you, would you want to see honest reviews of some of these patterns? And it was an overwhelming yes, because a lot of uh, consumers in the sewing world feel like they're not getting, they're feel like they're not getting like legitimate um, information about these companies. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed is that again, people are, and it's almost like you have to kind of tiptoe around those folks. Cause again, you don't want to be seen as like bullying them or like bashing yeah. a small business or anything like that. But at the same time, like, I'm sorry, if you're running a business, put on, you know, it's like, put on your, your adult pants. And if you're selling things to people for money, I think you should be able to handle constructive criticism or like legitimate feedback on the products you're selling and not have this expectation that everyone always has to say nice things about your company or your products. Cause you know, what if you do put out a, you know, cause there have been some indie sewing pattern companies that have had some problems, you know, with like size, you know, the sizing was off or like, you know, the instructions. And I've seen some there's a, and it's hard to vet some of these companies because the quality is all over the place with the patterns. So I think consumers are looking for higher quality vetting of these, these patterns because, you know, again, they're, and they're expensive. Some of them are like 20, mm-hmm. $25. If you're spending $25 on a dress pattern, you, you want to see leg- some legitimate reviews on it for, and feedback from real customers and it almost seems like that's really like, it's almost like, I don't know, it's almost like that kind, you know, that those sort of honest reviews are discouraged because you don't want to hurt their feelings, you know, and you don't yeah. want to attack a small business, you know. So I don't know. I don't know. I've, I haven't done a lot of reviews on those types of, I probably will, honestly, but I know if I do, I'm going to get some nasty DMs from these people. Like if I say anything you know, and again, not even bashing them, but even saying anything like mm-hmm. remotely not positive. Like, and I kind of, you know, so I don't know. it. I've been yeah. a little bit afraid. And even I've been a little bit afraid to do that type of content. Because like, I, you know. Yeah, I can so understand I that. I We have a lot of, um, there's a lot of handmade watercolor companies on Etsy. And uh, it, making watercolor is time consuming, laborious, and in my opinion, usually is no better than commercially made watercolors. Okay. So I, I, I've reviewed a couple handmade watercolor paints that I personally like, but I would be very, very, I, I don't know if I would review many handmade watercolor paints for that reason because it does take so much time to make it and it's it, they can't do it for the price that the, that the commercial yeah. company is doing it I mean you can get a, a pattern at Joanne's on sale for two bucks yep. you can't expect then they're selling you know probably millions of them whereas like a small indie pattern company that's selling a couple hundreds of them you know has to charge you know 20 15 20 30 dollars so I can understand that it's that's tough I probably yeah it's, it's I tend yeah, to shy away from that sort of thing too Oh, and it doesn't help that a lot of these designers are all friends, so they'll review each other's patterns. And of course, it's all like hearts and flowers because they're all like, but you know, they're all like buddies. So you're not going to say anything negative about your friend's pattern, you know? Like I don't know. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I think, yeah, I think if my friend, if I had a friend that had a product, uh, I would have to really love it. I, I don't. I think I would just be like, I don't. I don't think I can. I don't know. That's tough. It's, yeah, it's hard. And I, there's a lot of like debate about that type of thing. Um, I, I, do you ever go to on Reddit at all? It's kind of a scary times. place. Uh, but there's <laughs> craft uh, smart. 
Yeah, craft snark, they are, they're brutal in there. Like, but you can kind of find out the tea. You're like, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it can be, but a lot of them are complaining about the indie pattern designers of like knitting or sewing um, because they'll have problems with the pattern. And it's not like just one person is having problems with the pattern. It's mm. a wide group of people okay. who have problems with the instructions or like the, you know, there's like a, an error in it. And if anyone bothers to point out this to the pattern designer, they get really upset. So there, mm. there's kind of a whole, there's that kind of thing. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to get into that, but you know, as far as content goes, but I know it's, it's tough. Now I want to ask you, have you ever had any like real wacky, you don't have to name the brands. Have you ever had any like really like crazy uh, experiences with like a brand reaching out to you or like a sponsorship gone sideways or like, you know, anything kind of, kind of entertaining? I don't know. Let me think, you know, I, cause you, you provided me with this question before and I remembered something and now like, and now that I'm on the spot, I'm just like that. Whew, Did that, Morgan and Morgan I, reach out to you too? I don't know. Oh no, but I do get, to, I get a lot of, um, I get a lot of like clothing brands and makeup brands and stuff reaching out to me and they'll be like, or, or a travel, but like, we love your travel lifestyle content. I'm like, really? Like, you want a video? I'm shooting in the basement here. I'm not traveling anywhere. <laughs> I get the weirdest, uh. And they clearly haven't looked at your stuff because it, it, like, it, it, the email doesn't apply to you at all, you yeah. know. And you're like, well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah you're a pet influencer or a yeah. mommy blogger. I'm like, no, I'm not. No. Oh shoot! I wish I could remember the funny story because now I. That's right. If you are, if you remember it. it, feel free to interrupt, and we can like get back to it. well. And as far as like the free products go, um, so here I have like a very extreme example, but I think this highlights how how getting free products can be problematic. Um, do you remember, it was like last year with, with the Ocean Gate Titan disaster, uh, yeah. that sub that went down to the Titanic wreckage, the company was a hot mess. Obvi there were a lot of red flags with the company. And a lot of, like, and all of the reporting I saw about Ocean Gate was kind of uncritical, right? You're like, but then when you realize Ocean Gate had... Um, done a lot of influencer marketing and like media, like kind of like they would invite journalists on this trip to go down to the Titanic, um, you know, and they invited like YouTubers. So they had, you know, they would say, hey, YouTuber, you have 2 million subscribers. We'll invite you on this trip. Here was my problem with that. And I think this is a very extreme example, but can still highlight a point. The tickets for this trip are 250, were $250,000. And I noticed when I saw a CBS News report about Ocean Gate that had done, been done about a year before, you know, the disaster, the, they, you know, they invite this. It's like the CBS Morning Reporter. Obviously, it's kind of a fluffy piece, but I was really shocked that CBS News would greenlight that assignment because the reporter was receiving a something of the value of $250,000. Mm. So how are you like there is no way on earth, in my opinion, that he can even remotely be objective for a news piece. Um, and they also didn't really, like, they would say, like, they invited me along, but there was no FTC, you know, they didn't do any real yeah. disclaimers, like, you know, mm -hmm. this reporter received a free trip. Like, there was none of that. And I just found that very troubling that mm -hmm. this company had, and this company had done that a lot, like, for YouTubers and for other big influencers and for journalists. And, you know, you see, like, you know, like how, it, and obviously this contributed to the deaths of s several people, you know, and this, I, I just thought that was so grossly irresponsible. And I'm really shocked that a new, like a, you know, such a big news outlet like CBS News would not see a problem with that at all. Hmm. Are you sure they, they oh, got yeah, he that, went, he got that for he free? He for free. Yeah, he didn't pay. There's no yeah. way CBS would have paid for that. Like, but like, mm -hmm. and even at CNN, I don't think they would have, I don't think they would have allowed that because uh, all of the stations I worked at, they wouldn't, no news director I worked under would have, would have okayed that story just mm -hmm. because like $250,000 is more than a lot of people's homes. Like, can you yeah. imagine getting, can you imagine getting something of that dollar figure value and then doing like a news report on it? I just can't. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like it just, I yeah, think that about would be it. Tough. I just think that's kind of, 
I don't know. That seemed very unethical to me. And I noticed, like, there were, like, a lot of people were pointing out, like, after it happened, like, all of the hokey things about, like, the, the, like, the, the lights from Camper World, and they were controlling it with, like, a, like, a gaming controller. And the reporter mm-hmm. was very, uncr- like, he would kind of make jokes about some of the hokiness of the operation, but this was definitely not, like, an investigative piece. Let's just mm-hmm. put it that way. Um, but I think that's an example of how is that journalism? Like, that's not journalism at all. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, that's been, interesting. Yeah. Is there, a, do you think there's like a, a dollar amount where it, it should, you know, where you wouldn't be influenced? I think that right. would be a personal. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, where, it's like, where is the line? You know, is it $50 for you? Is it, and I think it's going to be different for different people. Um, like right. Marquez Brownlee, the guy that's been, you know, uh, pan for some of his recent reviews. Um, I think for him getting a $200 product wouldn't really like he can easily buy that stuff if he wants to, but I think it can be hard to determine. And it's obviously very, you know, on a case by case basis, like, and that's why I almost prefer to buy the cheaper products. You know, it's like, okay, it's $20. I'm just going to buy it, you know? But yeah, if I was getting something that was like $5,000, I I don't feel I could be objective at that point. You know, like I would say for me, maybe anything over like, maybe like $200. Like I, mm-hmm. I just for me personally, I just don't think, you know, cause it's not this, it's not the same as buying it, you know, mm-hmm. like when you have to shell yeah. out your own money for something, it is, it is different. Right. Cause you'll be mad if you're like, yeah. I'll be mad if Y'all something, well though, yeah, I'll be mad if, if I think something should be more like $20 and I paid 40 or $50 mm-hmm. for it. But even if someone, has, even if a company has sent me something and the list price is $50 and it's like, this should cost 20 bucks. What are you, what are you playing at? You know, I, I still feel like I can be objective with that because you've got to figure that any company that's willing to send you a $5,000 sewing machine is doing a calculation in their mind yeah. and they're saying, okay, if she doesn't like this, and she gives it a bad review, we're still going to get 6,000 people watching this. So, you know, it's still going to be like divide, they'll divide that up by what they're paying and get their cost per mill and see if it's better than doing a YouTube ad. And knowing they're going to get it in the content of the video, a whole video is going to be about it, which is way more valuable than a 30 second a skippable ad for it. So they're doing all these calculations. And the fact that it's just getting it out there and getting it potentially trending it's building brand awareness whether it's yep. whether it's a glowing review or not they're doing those calculations they're not giving it to you to be nice or because yeah. they like your channel <laughs> you know I mean uh, I think once I started understanding that it was kind of like you know you you have no obligation other than to do the honest review if you're if you're accepting the product but I see what you mean I think of course you know if, you, if it's an expensive machine and people are paying that much for it you want yeah. it to be good you don't want to know that other people are wasting their money but then again, if it is not great, then it's your. Yeah, it's tough. It's you your, know, it's. You have to be honest yeah. because you don't want more people to make that mistake if it isn't worth it. And because um, sometimes I think about that, if, especially if it's a popular product and you know that if you're criti- if you have anything critical to yeah. say about it, you're going to be you're going to be hurting people's feelings that paid full price for this. And yeah, they're going to be like, um, well, you don't want to yuck anyone's yum, but you also want to be like, you, you can uh, you got to approach it in a way like I can see how people like this product. For this and this and this reason, but for me and for other people like me that have this that want this particular feature, it's not going to do it for them. Like some of the people that bought the sketch after watching your video, yeah, I'm like, all right, they, the pros I and cons, were cool. but it might do, might do something yeah. that they want. You know, maybe they really love brother products. Um, maybe they really love something about that that there's something you don't even really they love. Care they about. love and apps. I don't know. If they love. They like apps. They love, they they love internet. They love yeah. internet well, the connected is, sewing machines. Yeah, I don't like, I don't want any of my devices to have to be covered to the, yeah. connected to the internet, but I could say, play devil's advocate and say, if you are subscribing to uh, a software that you have to pay a monthly fee for, you know that software is always updating. You know, it's always being updated, yeah. any bugs are being fixed, because they're incentivized to keep you subscribed. But I don't like a, a product that can be bricked if it's... If yeah, exactly. And they that's don't want to do. That's what you pointed Cricket. out with the Cricket. Cricket had a history yeah. of bricking machines. And yep. do you feel like if they do it once, they might do it again? Yeah. 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 You got one. Yeah. You got one strike. You got <laughs> one strike with this girl. <laughs> Have has Cricket ever reached out to you at all? Or no, no? never. I don't think nope. so. They actually reached out to me, but only to send me. I've been doing those videos about the updates, 
And they sent me a press release to make sure I got it. And I was like, okay. Oh, wow. To make sure that That's I was updating that they had walked back that policy of the like 20 uploads. Um, but that's the thing. I, I feel like some of these brands uh, don't like that there are people out there that they can't really control. And I, I kinda, I've gotten that vibe from some of them, you know. Um, and I know the good companies. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, the, the good companies will will be great when they are faced with criticism, though. Um, exactly. Like I, they should say, yeah. hey, you know, we appreciate this. And, uh, you know, like the guy, um, one of the guys with the company that Marquez Brownlee criticized, he actually had a pretty good. He's like, we really appreciate this and we're going to work to be better. Um, and, and another good thought about him is that most people had never heard of this product before he reviewed it. Like I'd never heard of it. So it did get the company's name out and they did get them, you know, I am of the belief that any publicity is good publicity just from working in news all these years. You know, it's like you and people have short attention spans. They kind of just remember your last at bat. So if you can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, how many celebrities have had scandals in the past and yeah. now are, you know, everyone's cool with, you know, just because, oh, you know, oh, sorry, the, their latest thing is, you know, they did something good you know, two months ago, so everyone just remembers that. They don't remember when they got arrested 20 years ago. So people mm -hmm. kind of tend to have short, you know, just short, short attention spans. Yes. And I remembered my story and it actually goes Ooh. along with this. All right, good. Um, so the, the good companies will listen to the feedback and improve their products. And so I had been reached out to a company and I'm not going to name them because they did everything right. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to bring any, any, Thing down on them. I didn't end up reviewing the product because when I got their product, it was a product that was actually made for children, but they reached out to me because they said, you do mixed media. I think you would really enjoy this product. And um, it was a type of, it was a type of kid's crayon, which um, I've never used on my channel. So if anyone's trying to figure out what it is, it's, I've never used it on my channel. So I got it and I was, I was looking at it. I'm like, this, this looks interesting, but then I'm like, boy, this is this should, this says can be used by any children under 14. I'm like, well, that's weird. And I had to translate the Chinese on the back of the package because oh there wasn't much English writing on it. I'm like, this is weird. But it was from, actually, it was from a brand that I've seen imported before that I've tried some of their adult products from adult art, su art supplies, and I like their products. And um, the first thing I noticed is that it doesn't have, there's a certain, um, there's a certain ASTM compliance rating that should be on any product that is sold in the United States for children. And it wasn't on the package. It had the CE symbol, which is a European symbol on there. And this is not funny. Ha ha, by the way, this is just kind of like a funny, like a strange story. But anyway, so it didn't have the labeling that was required for it to be sold in America. And then um, there was some other stuff on there that I thought was just really worded really weirdly. And it wasn't in English. And so they were going to be selling this on Amazon. And so I reached out to them and I said, I know you sent this to me because I'm a mixed media artist, but I can, it's clear, clear that you're, that this is a product that's marketed towards children. The, the shape of the product was definitely a choking hazard and, Ooh. um, and that didn't have the ASTM compliance on there for ch children's art materials to be sold in America. And I'm like, I'm not comfortable even showing this on my channel. And, um, uh, I don't think it's legal to be sold in this country. And they sent me back a full page saying, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. We weren't aware. And because um, I sent them links to like the, um, uh, what to the consumer, consumer.gov or with the consumer protection agency, cpa.gov, maybe it is, um, just with all that, all those things listed out so they could see where the compliance was and what they needed to be doing. I don't think the product was on, was on the, the chemicals and the product were unsafe because it was in, I translated the Chinese and it said it was all food grade pigments and dyes. But um, the fact that it didn't have that certification on it would make it illegal to be sold here. And because I recently found out about a lawsuit or a potential lawsuit when people were importing some Japanese colored pencils and the American distributor was like, these are not supposed to be sold in this country because it doesn't have the labeling on it. And that's what kind of like was like a red flag when I didn't see the labeling on that product. But they pulling it and re-getting re it tested because it has to wow. be independently tested. And then they're going to re-release it once that's done. And that's an expensive thing. That's not just a lot of animal, Amazon sellers aren't going to bother doing that. I mean, they're a company, but they sell on Amazon. Like a lot of third-party sellers, they have their own company, but they also sell on Amazon just to, that's where the people are. Um, but brands can come back and be like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't realize that. Or if, even if you do a video, 
um, I did a video once on making your own scoring tool, like the ScorePal. And um, actually the owner of ScorePal reached out to me and she's like, that's so innovative. You were so clever to come up with that. Would you like a ScorePal so you can test it and see how it compares to your homemade version? And it was just like, it was just the sweetest gesture. I use that ScorePal in every single video now because first she was so nice. Secondly, it works way better than my, you know, homemade one. And it was just, uh, it was just sweet how she reached out and she wasn't like, how dare you cease and desist, take that video down. You know, that's a trademark name. She was just like, so cool about it. And like, she put her money where her mouth was. She's like, try this out, see what you think, you know? And uh, I've had other situations where I've tried to like cut a die and I'm like, I just can't get this to cut with my machine. I think it was a waste of money. I wish I didn't buy it. And then the owner of the die company is like, if you tried this with this platform, it is going to work for you and just gave me a bunch of tips. And then, um, you know, it wasn't like, how dare you talk about my company? He was like, hey, this is how, this is how it will work so much better for you. And you know, not be going That's on actually the off pretty head. refreshing. And I'm amazed yeah. that a like an overseas Amazon seller actually wanted to comply with US regulations. Yeah. And that is, you know, that is something that we have to keep in mind. All of the kids' products are like there's so many regulations about safety mm-hmm. here. And that is really good to point out that yeah, anything for children just has rules up the wazoo. So people do need to know that. Um mm-hmm. that's really interesting. I I've had like I don't know. I, I feel like I haven't been as lucky as you. Like I've had companies that I had one company that they didn't send me any product. They had agreed to send me a product, but they hadn't sent it. And I had done a video about like a live stream or something about the launch of their product. And they, they wrote me an email. It wasn't even asking. It was telling me I had to change the title of the video. And I was like, yeah, screw. And after that, I just kind of doubled down and I shared the email with with everyone. And then I looked closer into the company and uh, it was a little, I'll just say it was a little sketchy. So I'm glad, I'm actually really glad that ended up happening because I had agreed to accept something. It was like basically a cricket knockoff. Um, mm-hmm. And their, their behavior was very weird, just mm-hmm. in our interactions and... Like, it's weird that they'll send an email to someone, but treat them like they work for you. It's like, I don't even really yeah. know you. Like, they're like, and, and they CC a bunch of other people in the office. I'm like, I, I, I don't work for this company. And they're mm-hmm. like, you need to change the title to this. And I was like, I'm not definitely not doing that, lady. Uh, and it was, it was just a very strange experience. And what I said about the company, it was very, it was all legit. It was, I wasn't saying anything, anything untrue. Um... And yeah, and they got, it was weird. So then I was like, hey, don't send, and then I kind of backed off. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to talk about this product then. And I'm not going to be accepting a machine from you. uh, Cause this is, I've gotten some strain. I don't know, just some, sometimes you feel like something's a bit off about the company and you're like, yeah, I just don't, I'm just not comfortable with this. It's just, I don't know, it gets weird. But I think the overseas, and this was one of those companies where, I looked into them and it was like one of those weird things where like some conglomerate owns everything, but this, they had like a bunch of different e-commerce websites in different spaces. And it's almost like they're just trying to sell random crap. Like, it's not like they were dedicated to crafting or anything. Mm -hmm. It was just like, you know, it was, you know, but they were trying to make it seem like this brand was like some sort of like homegrown crafting brand. And it wasn't. So I was like, I'm just not. Uh, like they sold uh, wigs, they sold, they sold like uh, knockoff U.S. military gear. And I was like, okay, this is weird. weird. And it's like a Chinese company. So I was like, but it's chi- it was Chinese. It was headquartered in France, but not really like I, they uh, weren't really, they were definitely not French. Um, and then they did like this product launch on Facebook, but they used these avatars with like out real people. It was very like the whole thing was kind of bizarre. So I was like, I think I just need to wash my hands of the situation so I was like I'm out of here I don't know but yeah I've had I I can't think of any situations where I've had like a very pot I don't know I I've mostly had pretty weird experiences maybe it's just me I don't know but I'm glad maybe you just actually, so much different yeah I don't know I'm just like yeah I well I've had a few maybe okay ones but yeah I've just had some weird I've had some weirdos I don't know okay so I I do want to ask you something if you could sort of wave a magic wand and change, change some things about uh, the crafting industry and how influencer marketing works, 
are there is there anything you would you would want to do like or you know maybe make different policies or how things work like what would you want to maybe uh, change about influencer marketing um if i had a magic wand yeah if you could do I anything would, and it would be possible i'd get rid of affiliate marketing honestly even though like to say that i'm somebody that benefits from it um i think that the the prevalence of affiliate marketing has made it so companies no longer have to hire educators and it's all anybody that wants to be a successful educator working in a space and wants to teach the way they're going to get paid is by selling product. And um, I think that you we really lost a lot of wholesome entertainment because of that and, and wholesome, wholesome um, education because of that. Just like any um, anybody that wants to be on a design team, if they're going to make any money from this is they have to sell the product. They have to get affiliate monies rather than you're going to be paid for creating this artwork that's going to go to a trade show or it's going to be featured in a magazine or it's going to be featured on their website or to be featured next to the product. You're, you're more paid for your ability to sell. You're totally paid by your ability to sell, not your ability to create um, interesting products or to teach interesting techniques. And um, I think that's really been a disservice to the educators and to the public that's watching the content, but I can understand why they don't, because that would mean a lot less stuff would be sold and people would be buying a lot less stuff. And then I guess how would the economy run? But it'd be wonderful if there was a way for artists and crafters to be able to make a decent living by educating uh, without having to worry about the sales so much. So I guess that would be, yeah, let's just take the marketing out of, yeah, what we need to do take the you're right though because this is all about selling you have to in order to be successful as like a content creator now especially in this space you have to sell some like everyone's selling something again even if you just make videos you're basically providing an ad platform either you sell your own products or you sell you know people sell memberships people sell you know do the sponsorships it really is more sales focused than it is about the creation at this point. So you you are right about that. And I I can see how that's really changed the space. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love the fact that we can, because it's expensive. Like I found out when I tried to add the blog, the video package to my blog, it was expensive to add video. Um, somebody's got to pay that bill and Google pays the bill for our YouTube videos. So, I mean, I can understand that they have to make some money in order to be able to pay for that because it's pricey. Um, And I love that I can give free content to people that want to learn how to paint or they want to learn how to craft. They want to learn technique or they just want to be entertained and they can get that for free. Uh, But with that also comes with, okay, so ads don't pay that well. So it's like, okay, put the affiliate links in to, and not to say that, um, you know, I deserve to make this amount of money, this amount of money for each video. I I don't mean to say that because I do it for fun anyways. It's, it's, I did it for fun for, for a long time. I think one thing people don't realize is how much free work you have to do before you actually get to a point where you're making money off of your, um, your YouTube videos or whatever. But, um, and then I, I do have courses for people that want to really dive deep because the more advanced stuff doesn't really do well on YouTube. Longer videos don't really do as well on YouTube. So there is that there. But I know there's a lot of people that would love to learn, that would love to take those longer classes, but um, it's just not in their budget. So they're, so I do want to have the stuff on there on YouTube for, for anybody to enjoy for free, whether they're just a casual crafter or they're somebody who wants to paint a couple hours on the weekend or there's somebody that is just you know trying to piece together their own education from free content on on YouTube because there's a lot of really good stuff out there. Uh, But the incentive for the creators is, you know, sell some stuff so you can keep doing it. It's, you don't get paid for the quality of your, well, I guess roundabout, you do kind of get paid by the quality of your content if people watch it, but there's a lot of really high quality stuff out there from really smart people that just doesn't get viewed because it's either too long or the algorithm has picked it up. And um, it's just a shame. It's just a shame that you kind of have to be, I don't know, you have to be a certain, you have to fit into a certain mold for, I don't know, I hate to go the boogeyman, the algorithm, you know, but there's, there's certain things it's looking for and there's certain things yeah. that they're going to serve up to people and you can have half a million subscribers, but if you're not showing up on their homepage, they're not going to see your videos unless they directly go to their sub feed and scroll down to your video and, and choose it from there. It's, uh, it's very, 
home feed based nowadays. So it's it's a lot of competition and I don't know. It, it seems like things always seem online, always seem to change for, I don't know, for the worse. It seems like things start out so pure and good and then they, they get all um, corrupted. I don't know. I'm part of the problem too. I'm not even like innocent. Well, and that's another thing I wanted to point out is you do, you have developed your own uh, online courses that people can take. And I do think that's a good kind of way around all of the marketing and influencer stuff is by, again, you're educating online. And again, you probably have a lot of people who watch you that are willing to pay for the courses because they like your free content enough. Um, and that's a good way to kind of remain independent in a way too, because again, you don't really have to worry about sponsors with your courses or anything like that, uh, because people are paying directly for that content. Mm. Um, so that is a really, I think that is a really good way. Um, you know, if for the people who might not be that into the influencer marketing thing, but still want to create content is to develop something of your, your own, uh, whether it be courses or like, do, do, do in-person teaching too? Yes, but not a ton. I'm, I'm going to France next week to Ooh. teach a watercolor workshop or in, in a week. Um, and then I'll do like small local classes at my local library because I'm a huge fan of local libraries and uh, encouraging people to use their local libraries and to volunteer at the local libraries because, you know, once people stop using them, that'll be the first thing that, yeah. you know, they want to cut from the budgets, the town budgets and stuff. So, uh, so I'll do that. But most of my teaching is online. It's... Um, you know, it started because my cat was home with little kids and it's continued because I can reach the most people and make the most impact. Yeah, you're right. Well, this has been an awesome conversation, Lindsay. Thank you so much for sharing your candid thoughts about influencer marketing. Uh, so where can people find you online and what, what do you, do you have anything? I saw you were launching a new class. Uh, so where, where do you want to direct people to, to go? And by the way, we also have another conversation on Lindsay's channel that will be up uh, by the time this gets posted, and I will link that in the description box and in a pinned comment below this video as well. Well, if you want some free YouTube videos on The Frugal Crafter on YouTube, you could go to The Frugal Crafter. Actually, if you just Google The Frugal Crafter, my blog will come up, my YouTube channel will come up. Um, my school is lindsaywyrick.teachable.com, but you can get to everything from The Frugal Crafter. So if you just Google it, you'll get right there. <laughs> it's pretty easy. All right, wonderful. Well, you guys head over to Lindsay's channel for more for more conversation. Um, go over there right now. Anyways, I'm Jen with Sewing Report Live. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you guys again in the next one. And remember, whatever you're doing, make it fun.